Hello, I'm Norman Swan. Welcome to this very special Rural Health Education Foundation program. It's on women and rural medicine. There are more women than men training in medicine, starting to be more women than men going into general practice, particularly in the country, and particularly international medical graduates. And there are issues which are specific to women making this choice. I'll be joined by Jenny May, chair of the Rural Doctors Association of Australia Female Doctors Group, and several other women GPs who are passionate about their rural practice. What are the statistics? Well, statistics are that if for medical students, there are about 58% of graduating medical students are women. And we know that entering general practice training programs, uh, the number of women goes up to about 65%. So getting up to two out of three of general practice trainees are women. We need more female doctors in country areas because country people want female doctors as well as male doctors. There are real issues that might be happening in families that can be spoken about to your female GP and because um, the women on the farm are also going to have issues that maybe they can't go and talk about to the male GP if he's friends with their husband. There's a lot of challenges in getting doctors into rural and remote areas. I work in an area that uh, is relatively close to Melbourne. Uh, depending on the traffic, you can easily get there within a couple of hours. But even there, we can't attract doctors. They don't seem to want to come and do the style of medicine which we do, which is very sad because I think it's a very exciting place to practice medicine. You know, for 12 years I did flying clinics out to places like Bullier and Birdsville. And you're flying over really some of the most beautiful parts of Australia. And, you know, I used to think sometimes looking out of the aircraft, oh, I'm being paid to do this. I mean, it was absolutely beautiful. How are you? And now let's meet Jen DeLima, who currently works in Alice Springs. Hi, Steve. You want to come through? She initially left Sydney to work in a remote community in central Australia. Kintore is 540 kilometres due west of Alice Springs. It's a Rama 7 area. We had to catch a charter plane out there, a little four-seater plane. And when we first went out to have a look at the community, um, Alice Springs or central Australia had, had a big wet. So Kintor had not had any communication with Valis Springs for two plus weeks, which meant there was no food that had gone into the community, no money, uh, no provisions. So we were the first plane that had arrived in there. Um, and with us came the money tin for the people to be paid, to be able to go to the shop to buy food. There was a lot of people, the whole community there, speaking a different language. I had landed in another country. And I was scared. My first impression of that place was I was terrified and I wanted to get back on that plane and back to Sydney. Quick. But the plane had left. And we were stranded for at least another 36, 48 hours before the plane would come back. I'm thankful, very, very thankful, because we then met the community. Our son had time to just play and enjoy himself while we were talking to the elders. And at the end of that 36 hours, all three of us knew that we were coming back. The community were very, very welcoming. They couldn't facilitate more than, than they did socially, work-wise. Um, some of the women there took on to be my mentor. Without them I'd be lost. Because so many times I'd start off in the wrong direction and it would be, no, this is how we do this. This is how we'll do this. And they were, they were my great advisors and, and they may not have had medical training, but they made life easy. My greatest fear was, would my emergency skills stand me in good stead? Could I actually manage without all the props of an emergency department, all the facilities, the amenities, the other staff? Um, could I do it? 
would I ever be able to go to a proper third world environment and survive and be useful? I've always been a city person, so a general practitioner was the general practitioner in the city who did the start of things, never got their fingers dirty, never got to do things. And so that could never be me. But going out to the community, the um, generalist medical practitioner does everything. You've got the emergency medicine stuff, which you know sets your adrenaline on fire. But then you've also got that patient, their background, their home. You, can, you have the potential to do a door-to-door -door service. You know, you're involved in the transport. You're involved in their social situation. You're involved in their financial situation. You're involved in every aspect of that person. Because you've got Rotary tonight. I'm going Rotary. Mm -hmm. but, um, Paul was studying school with School of the Air, but that requires an adult to be a tutor with the child and take them through, especially through primary school. And that was Peter's primary role. So he was Paul's tutor. And Paul had not been doing that well in Sydney with his studies. Um, and this child just blossomed. Within, within three months, he had blossomed. He was learning with such uh, enthusiasm. And the two of them just we're working so well together. I think it's a great opportunity for children and it takes them outside of their, um, their comfort zones as it does for, for most people that take on a new position or whatever. Um, so, you know, Paul was readily accepted into a group of young Aboriginal boys and girls and they just disappear for hours and, and quite often we wouldn't see them from sunrise to sunset and when we quizzed them as what they did all day, they were just roaming around the bush and the sand hills and um, you know, eating native foods and berries and even to the point of, you know, catching birds and having them for lunch. Yeah, it went really well. It had a very positive um, effect on him and also um, I think now that he's 16 uh, we're seeing a high level of independence in him um, and self-resourcefulness um, and I th I'd put that down to, you know, those sort of experiences. I think we realised that we were going to be never returning to Sydney as our home, probably within that first year of being out at Kintor. For our family, it was where we needed to be, the space we needed to be, the lifestyle that we wanted. Um, for Paul, I couldn't better his schooling. And that, I suppose for me, that was number one. I could not better his schooling. Um, career-wise, for me, it was, career-wise, it was where I could, there was, the world was my oyster. Um, the permutations, the combinations of practice were just, and have been, just enormous. Eventually, Jen settled with her family in Alice Springs. So is that an early morning? meeting or is it later uh, in the day? Nine, the whole day. So that's the whole day. Now I've actually slowed down and so I'm doing drug and alcohol medicine, so addiction medicine and sexual assault medicine. Um, and between those two clinical roles I'm involved with education of medical students and GP registrars, some of them as remote GP registrars, so they're out on the remote communities in Rama 7 areas and I regularly teleconference in with them. Hello Peter, how are you? How's your week been? As their support person, their mentor and also as helper with their training. Okay, so Peter, I'll fax that through to you, I'll mark it up. In the big picture, the finances are not at that level of what the city person would earn. And, and I guess you do 
I know that, okay, I would be earning differently if I was in that city environment. But um, the balance on that is the lifestyle that I'm enjoying. Um, the balance is the career challenge. Alice Springs offers everything. I'm definitely not impressed by traffic and you know, the humdrum push of cities. I'd much rather live in a small community and, and have an identity as well. You know, where you, where you go into a shop and someone remembers your face. The ability to use your time, every moment of your time, is valuable time. Every activity you're involved with can be a quality activity rather than sitting in the car for two and a half hours driving. I have a bicycle as well. I'm getting myself coordinated <laughs> in cycling and, you know, it's lovely to be able to cycle to work and there's no smog. And as I'm, you know, not a hugely confident person in these sporting arenas, um, for me to be able to do that is a huge step outside the box. Hi Steve, how have you been? Oh, good, thank you. Thank you. Good. For someone who really wants to practice medicine in its purest form, that is, be a health healer, stroke carer, this is the environment that allows you to do it, to look after your patient as a whole person that links with their community. Sleeping well? Yes. You can't do it in any other environment, I don't think. This is where people are in need and I can make just a tiny difference. Bring that humanity, bring my skills, bring whatever little I have to offer. Because you get that and, you know, the city has lots of doctors, lots of services, lots of everything in comparison. And this is where you've got that match between what you went into university to study, to do, and you can do it. What do you think are the key issues for women thinking about general practice or women in general practice in rural areas? For women in rural practice there are a variety of options really um, and the other, I think the other really important message is that being part or being a, a general practitioner in a rural area is not a decision you make for the rest of your life but it's something that you might want to consider and certainly many of us have had very enjoyable and um, challenging careers working in rural areas. Isn't that part of the problem, that people see it as a four-year option and then when the kids get to high school you go back into town? I don't see that as a huge problem. I think coming to a rural area for four years, often people come for four years and then they stay and they think of other ways of doing it. But I think coming for four years, um, having you know, the experience of living in a rural area and, and the experience of living in a rural community, uh, four years is not a bad, bad chance or, or a bad time. Obviously, personally, um, you know, if you do enjoy um, being down the road, living in the inner city um, to the drone of the traffic and the, uh, and the aeroplanes landing every 60 seconds, then you're going to miss that um, because rural areas are definitely quieter. But, um, and it, I guess it depends also on your partner or spouse. If, if they've got a job that is untransportable to a rural area, even for, for a short period of time, obviously those decisions are very difficult. Are there a preponderance of husband and wife practices? You know, anecdotally there are, but there are equally a large number of women who elect to go to country areas and rural areas as single, as breadwinners, as the major partner bringing in the income, and often, you know, are happy to have a partner who's happy to help with childcare and, do, and even work part time. My husband was a teacher originally. Uh, he elected, or we, we decided that uh, he would be the main person at home and I would go out to work and so he stayed home brought up the children and has seen no need to go back teaching. I actually went to medical school in Newcastle met my husband who came from Tamworth um, there and did some of my training in Newcastle some of my residency in Newcastle and then moved with him back to his hometown um, after we had our first child. And did he do the medicine? No he actually is a civil engineer. So we sort of waited in Newcastle until he'd organised um, some work that suited him and uh, moved back to Tamworth to be closer to some family support when we had a little child. I work with my husband. Um, he also is a, is a uh, GP 
rural doctor. And um, yeah, so we moved to Camperdown 18 years ago when we had just one child. My husband came to the rural practice because he wanted to work in the country. He wanted the breadth and the independence, I think, of rural practice. There's a considerable number of female doctors who are actually married to other doctors, uh, which I guess if they're both GPs or they both uh, have skills that are utilised in a rural area, that makes it easier for them. Although in other ways it can be more difficult with on-call because it means within the family that they're getting twice the amount of on-call that you would do if you've only got one doctor in the family. And the, most of the other female doctors within our practice are actually married to doctors within the practice as well. And if you're single? And if you're single, well, there's lots of options. <laughs> lots of, lots of blokes. Lots of blokes. And, and lots, of, lots of choices. I mean, living in a rural area doesn't mean you never come to the city. I think you'd be surprised at the frequent fly points that numerous of our rural GPs can clock up in, in participating in things in the city as well as, as, as living in a country area. But apart from living in a different kind of community, either you know, it could be a regional centre or it could be a small town or in a remote practice, is it really that much different from being a woman in general practice in the city? There are some very specific issues around on call. There are some specific issues about being able to work um, either alone or supported um, vicariously from other people if you're living in a very small community that are very different. And, and the challenge of, of the type of practice is sometimes quite different. But, but the mechanics of general practice are the same whether you're living in Sydney or whether you're living in Burke. So what models are out there? Look, there's a range of models. and. Um, they vary from obviously in remote locations living on site but also some fly-in fly-out models that we're seeing increasingly to service more remote um, locations. One of the practices to, to consider is Sheila Cronin who is providing a fly-in fly-out service to Cloncurry in Queensland. And she's based? And she's based on, on the Sunshine Coast. I sort of practice in two locations really. I spend some time working in Cloncurry, uh, which is uh, an outback mining town. Um, it's near Mount Isa. I spend, um, uh, over the last three or four years, I spent most of my time working there, but recently I've, um, I just work there part time. But the rest of the time I actually work on the coast, um, you know, on the Sunshine Coast, which is nearly 2,000 kilometres away. Cloncurry's had a major problem with doctors over the years, and um, my, um, I start, uh, the reason I actually went there was that my husband uh, is a, had started a business there and, uh, which he, and he involved in visiting Cloncurry and um, I, we just thought it was an opportunity to try and actually do something with Cloncurry. So uh, basically with some friends, um, some uh, other medical friends, we decided to tackle Cloncurry and see if we could solve the medical uh, workforce problem there by applying uh, principles uh, which we knew would work um, to actually attract young doctors. From a situation where three years ago there was one locum doctor trying to look after a hospital and, this, and a community of 5,000 people totally on his own being on call day and night and going you know really almost uh, crazy with tiredness we now have a situation where we have between four and five doctors um, in Cloncurry we have a brand new facility, uh, we teach medical students, we have registrars, and that's what we've done. Doctors are working differently uh, nowadays, and uh, in fact in our, our, our practice in Cloncurry we have several doctors who, um, who fly and fly out. And the fact is, is that if you do provide uh, good housing, um, proper on-call rosters so that people are only on-call maximum one in three. You do provide training and you do provide excellent facilities. You can actually attract doctors and I think we have proved that. If we come into some of the, the larger communities, we might consider something like Alice Springs working in an Aboriginal medical service. Aboriginal medical services and similar services are, are good models often for women who don't wish to, um, you know, pay large amounts or buy real estate in rural areas, understandably, because obviously it's a walk-in, walk-out model where you can negotiate often a salary or a percentage or a way of practicing or, or a way of being remunerated for your practice that works um, better for you, particularly um, giving you more flexible hours. 
I tell you about a practice that I used to be in with my husband and another female practitioner in Tom Price in Western Australia. The three of us worked part time. The three of us worked 0.5 each. So we did provide an on-call service. It was a one in three on-call service for the hospital. But at, at no time were we expected to be in the surgery at all times doing the job. Now you're right, when the chips were down, all three of us would be at the hospital if there was an emergency. But the expectation was that we would support each other and the community would keep their expectations reasonable that all three of us could sustain living in the town. And we were able to live in that town for four years under that arrangement. And other industrial issues, for example, if you're going to go into somebody else's practice? There are, Norman, and what we know from the, from the statistics is that women have longer consultations and they earn less than men. So you need to go in with your eyes open, um, working out what value you put on your services, the way you practice and the skills that you're going to bring to a community. So you might be better on a salary than fee-for-service? You may be or you may want to negotiate a fee-for-service arrangement with a baseline or with an understanding of, the, of those skills that you're bringing to that practice environment. What other things do you think are key negotiating points if you're at the point of choosing a practice? What, do you look, what should you be looking for and what sort of things, apart from the ones you've just mentioned, should you be negotiating? Well, most women are looking for flexibility. Uh, women remain primary child carers so it may be that you do want to go to the sports carnival or that if there is an appointment or or something to be arranged for someone you want to be there so inherent flexibility um, school holidays those sorts of issues which are difficult with on-call arrangements are the sorts of things that you might be bringing to the table as as key things to negotiate because everybody wants those off that's right everybody wants school holidays the other difference which we probably should have mentioned earlier with metropolitan practice is that you get to do much more procedural work. You can and that is the challenge in terms of of many rural practices. Well it's also part of the fun isn't that's it? That's right, that's right and it's part of the choice that that um, being able to provide a procedural service be that obstetrics, be that anaesthetics, be that surgery or be that extended emergency work is a huge um, challenge but also a service to a rural community. You can go to work and you really don't know what's going to happen for the day, even though you know you might be set out to have just routine appointments at the clinic, the people who come to see you can have a wide variety of issues that you're going to deal with, or it may be that something completely unexpected happens and you end up doing something that you really would imagine you would be doing at the start of the day. So I think that's been one of the, uh, the surprises, one of the things that keeps me going in a rural area. In accident and emergency, um, a lot of people seem to uh, not like that standing thinking, okay, the ambulance is just called, I've heard that there's somebody coming in uh, who's chopped off their hand, what am I going to do about that? Um, but I actually find that really stimulating. I, you know, it's amazing what you can remember actually when, when, um, when you're standing there. Um, and. And it's a great feeling when, when you finish that job and you can stand back and say, I did that. I did that well, I think. Um, we do uh, minor operations, uh, so minor ops, removal of skin lesions and so on. N none of us are actually GP obstetricians or GP anaesthetists, but we do provide um, uh, VMO care for our patients in the hospital setting for palliative care. We have nursing home patients and we admit to the local hospitals for simple um, illnesses. So we have that. All of us also have um, other areas of interest that we work in. So we work in general practice, but we have other sort of specialist interests. So one of my colleagues, Carmen, she's a medical educator part time. So she works with the registrars in the in the region. She's also a lactation consultant with a special interest in that area. Um, Gillian Rawlings, who's the other partner, works um, at, again in um, training medical registrars, but also she works on management committees and provides her expertise in that area. And I happen to work in sexual health and uh, with S100 um, prescribing rights in HIV in that area as well. Doing general practice placement last year in Leeton, there, um, the GP, she did anaesthetics, um, she was also did obstetrics, so one day we're in surgery while she was doing the anaesthetics for the surgery, the next day she was delivering some babies, and then the next day she was back in her practice seeing patients. And the, just the diversity about it, that range of experiences and skills that she had, and she was 
highly like skilled and had done many extra courses to be able to develop those skills. Um, I just think that's an exciting thing to be able to do. And I believe there's a preponderance of women in international medical graduates as well. Yes. Um, both Australian medical graduates and international medical graduates entering rural training schemes are, are more likely to be women. OK, well, let's now go to a rural practice in South Australia where there are two women GPs, one of whom is an international medical graduate. Barham is about 250 kilometres northeast of Adelaide on the Murray River. Uh, Barma has a huge, beautiful lake, Lake Bonnie, which you can yacht on, you can windsurf, and the birds are, well, we take the birds for granted, but everybody else notices the birds. It's a population of about 4,500. Uh, we service about 6,000, because there's quite a few small little towns around us. Plus, there's the Riverlands, actually five towns, all around about the same size. So there's sometimes we see people from other towns as well, and they see our patients as well. We have uh, 3.25 full-time equivalent doctors here, two full-time male doctors. I work about three quarters time and uh, our other female doctor works about half time. We also have a registrar at the moment. We often have two registrars and we have a full-time student um, all the time. Here's the flu injection. Okay, to the nurses. Good morning. Elizabeth's our half-time doctor. She came with her husband as an overseas trained doctor from Kenya. She came about seven, eight years ago. When we did the interview to come over to uh, Australia, they did want to find, uh, they did ask us uh, what exactly we wanted. Did we want to work in the city, rural country, and about how big a, a population would we want to, would we be happy to work in? We had no much idea about Australia, but we gave them an idea. And when we did come for a look around to Balmra, we met Dr. Newsom, who took the day off to actually take us around. And then all the staff in the clinic, they had a lunch for us, waiting for us. So they really were welcoming and they were ready to give us, the two of us, uh, positions and be flexible enough because we had two little children. That was something they really uh, stressed, that they would give us time to settle in, uh, child care was a problem, so they helped us find child care. And then schooling, we were shown the different schools available in the area. And then housing, where we would have to stay, they had organized a unit for us. So we went and thought about it overnight, and we liked what we had seen, what they had offered us. And yeah, when we went back, we decided the yeah, Abama would be it. Elizabeth and Raphael, honestly, I don't think anyone ever thought about them being overseas trained doctors there. They're excellent doctors, so the town was just happy having them. That was actually quite um, a surprise. We didn't think they would accept us that easily, but they were really quite welcoming. They, they came in to see who are these new doctors, because we've already been put in the newspaper that we are coming in, the, in this little village. So they already knew, wanted to know more about us. Very welcoming. Um, and some have uh, continued being our patients since the first day we, we, we started seeing them. They still keep coming back. So, no, it's really been well, lovely. Very few minor incidences with very few people, but they've also turned around. In fact, they end up becoming your good friends. Is that all? No other medical problems in the past? No. Yeah. Have you got sore ears? No, not anymore. Okay, I moved here about 18 years ago. Before that, I was working in the UK, and there was four doctors here. We were a, a busy practice with a very busy hospital. Uh, at that time, I did a lot of obstetrics. I used to do about 50 deliveries a year. Um, since that time, um, more of the services have been concentrated in the regional hospital, which is 20 kilometres away. Um, obstetrics has been closed in Barmara, um, theatre has been closed, and accident and emergencies now only open between 8 in the morning and 6 o'clock at night. And we do a GP after our service until 10 o'clock at night, and then after that everything's diverted to the regional hospital. I was Annette's first patient when she arrived in Barmara. The day before she was supposed to start, the doctor that I was to see wanted to sneak off, and Annette took it on. Um, I can't even remember that, yeah. yeah. Uh, spent a few days in hospital. And that was an organophosphate poisoning, wasn't it? It was. Yeah. 
Because we've lost quite a few services, we had to think about how we might attract doctors. And we felt the best way was to start to develop a more family friendly and flexible practice. Uh, so what we've tried to do is make it that anybody who comes to work in our practice can develop a work any way that they like. But I suppose females just prefer to work more limited hours. Uh, we earn a little bit less, but not a great deal less. And I certainly earn as much as the men do. Whereas if they want to come here and earn more money um, and work harder, then they, there's plenty of work. And they can also do accident and emergency work in the regional hospital that's only 20 kilometres away. And we've made it flexible in the surgery. So we all work hours which are flexible. Mm. So, which works very well. Otherwise, uh, yeah, that is, we wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't family friendly. It is yeah. very family friendly. We put a big, big emphasis on that. Yeah, because I'm part of the practice. I'd want to work as much as everybody else, but I just couldn't. No, you might just need to take some time over the school holidays or the children will get sick. So having a very flexible practice does help. So you've been keeping well since I saw you? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I've really changed my working hours since I came to Barmra. Still plenty or have we run a bit low? No, no, no. That's all settled? As the children have grown, my working hours have really changed every, almost term. Mm. Uh, but now they're more stable now that they're in school. At the moment, we probably have got a little balance because uh, I'm not doing as much emergency medicine anymore. Did you carry your ballet bag? Yeah. So I'm not as stressed or rushed as I used to be. Otherwise, that used to be a bit hard. That used to really take a toll on us and that was not good for the children. <laughs> See you. Have a good day. All the best. Bye-bye. Generally, we are happy where we are at the moment in our life. Uh, we've become citizens in the last two years, so we feel quite settled. Well, we always think that it's better to have doctors who stay here a long time than doctors who work incredibly long hours and stay a short time. So that's why we've tried to make our practice one that people can choose to work shorter hours or longer hours if they want, depending on what stage of life they're at. You still work? Yes. Sunday evening, go get the ironing done and for the school uniforms. Elizabeth only works school hours, which is fine with us, and uh, the only time she has troubles is sometimes picking kids up from school, but often the receptionist or one of the other doctor's wives or something, if they're picking up their kids, will bring them all back to the surgery, and uh, we might have up to 10 kids at our surgery after um, school, so we're actually considered the number one place for kids to come after school. We just run out of biscuits sometimes. We encourage people to take at least a week's holiday every three months, so that means that every three months you get a break. Um, and then once a year we take three or four weeks off so we can have a long holiday and then over Christmas we encourage everybody to take four or five days off. It might be if you're working Christmas you get the New Year period off. It's going to be good in this day then? Yeah, a few plants. We'll get a few plants out here. We've, uh, well, I have grown in, a, in the city, but I didn't mind rural, can, rural sort of setting. Raphael has done both, and we just thought for the children, we would like to bring them up in the rural country. It's a fantastic place for kids to grow up. It's just there's so much to do. I grew up in an area like this, which is much more I love it so much. You know, you can be out in the bush, uh, you can have animals, you can be swimming, you can play sport as much as you like. Um, so it's just a really good, healthy way to grow up. Oh yeah, we're supposed to get another chook. We'll get another chook. I might try and do that for you tomorrow. We, we discussed once many years ago about uh, why people came and did a, came into rural medicine. And I think it's because I came, because I love the lifestyle, that that's the reason why I've stayed here. I live on eight and a half acres of um, heritage protected land, which is like living in the middle of a national park. It used to have three big lawns, which we've taken out, and we've put in a swimming pool, which actually is water neutral. I have no street lights, so my skies are beautiful, and my, um, well, as you can see, the weather's just magnificent. Because I'm single, I actually like going back to Adelaide a lot, so every second or third weekend, I actually drive back to Adelaide. And uh, if you do the maths, because it only takes me seven minutes to get to work, um, I've worked it out that I could drive to Adelaide every weekend and still be driving less than someone who tr drives half an hour to work. So people always think it's a long way to travel back and forth, but 
Actually, I drive a lot less than most people in the city do. I always describe myself as a city girl in the country because I do like all the city luxuries. I go to Melbourne every couple of months and I go to Sydney twice a year. So, you know, the way we've set up the practice, you don't miss out on anything. And it's just a really good life. If a woman's watching this who's, say, a GP registrar in the city but kind of thinking that the country might be good, um, you, might, you might wonder, what's the balance between fear and fun, if you like? There is no doubt that there are some times when, you know, the amount of sweat under your armpits is, is overwhelming when you find yourself in a situation where ideally you would be handing it on to, to, to someone else. And you can't, you know, the reality of the geography or, or the circumstance are that you need to provide the primary care there and then. But I have to say that that is a situation in which usually you're never completely alone and often you're standing with a, a quite senior nurse or other allied health professional and let's face it, you do the best you can. I guess the other thing about women in practice is most women aren't scared of working in teams. In fact, I think they do it quite well and rural general practice um, and often remote general practice has been a team effort for a long time. So this sense of, of isolation, professional isolation and lack of support can be counted and, and is being counted in many of the models that might interest people considering rural practice. People like to be treated in their own community and that's, that's what we aim to do. So if we identify that there's a need for clinical knowledge to enable somebody to be looked after in our community, we go off and learn that. Um, a couple of months back I thought, oh, I don't really, they're, they're talking about some new stuff with chronic renal disease and I don't really know that I'm up to date with that stuff. So I picked up the phone and talked to um, our local division of general practice um, professional development manager and said, can you get somebody up to talk about chronic renal disease? Within a month we had an um, a event in Camperdown with, um, with a really, really good, um, yeah, it was a really good educational event and they're small. So there were four of us with, with the one um, renal physician who, who really ran a uh, question and answer session for us. Say a town like Moree, which is too far away from anywhere else not to have a birthing service, not to have access to emergency surgery. There are some very good collegiate models um, of men and women working in general practice and it's the sort of place that we can encourage registrars and we can support registrars to learn procedural skills and, and, and not feel that sense of total professional isolation. We're a community uh, and we know that we need to support each other in order to continue to work effectively in that community and other people coming in and seeing what we do and how we support each other they seem to be surprised at the level of, of support for the doctors for each other. If you've had to deal with a difficult situation such as uh, dealing with a birth that results in a, in a stillbirth the support that you get from your colleagues has been tremendous. We have good support also from the specialists in uh, Warrnambool and Geelong that are uh, they're an hour away but um, we have a, a strong relationship with them so that if I've got if I've got a problem I just pick up the phone and talk to them and um, you know sometimes I send emails with a you know with, with a thing that I think they probably won't be able to answer straight away but yeah so I don't I, I feel well supported I um, work a lot with the Royal Australian College of GPs, I work a lot with the Royal Doctors Association. Um, Flinders University has full-time students up here and they have a presence up here. We have a lot. Teaching the students is great and of course we have registrars here all the time. So Sturt Flurio um, are up here all the time giving them education and educating us at the same time. So taking on the teaching of people has meant that the organisations that support them support us as well keeps us fresh. One of the things that we haven't really talked about here is that women's careers in medicine are very much attuned to life stages, aren't they? Very much. And, and for most of us, the, the, there is this interruption or, or a change in the way you practice, obviously, when you're having your family. So for many of us, we did our training, um, then we went to a rural area, then we've interrupted or done it differently while we've had small children, and then it looks different with primary school aged children, and then there are challenges again with high school aged children. So it is very much a life stage 
um, phenomenon and that's what I was alluding to earlier. I don't think you have to go rural with the plan of, of being entrenched in a community for the rest of your life. I think there are a number of life stages where living rurally actually works very well. But that was really talking about that you might be part-time for a period and then you might be full-time then come back to part-time. You're not going to necessarily have the same career in different stages of your life. That's right. I think um, not having a, a definite path is also important because I think one of the things that happens is in our lifetime um, the path that we choose tends to change and we need to have an open mind to where that may lead us. I think regional centres offer the opportunity for female practitioners in particular to have supportive environments around them so that they can practice in a variety in a diverse way. Um, but at different times I have gone and done some work out in some of the smaller communities because that suited what I was able to do at the time. I, I would then choose when my children were quite young not to go out and do that sort of work. Now women often feel they come to a threshold decision when the kids are about 11 or 12. You've got two kids and there's a whole issue of high school. What decisions did you make? Interestingly, I think what influenced me there was that my husband had grown up in that particular town and he had actually been schooled in the local public school system and he'd done particularly well in that system and so had confidence in the state system. Um, we've chosen to school our children in the local state school and have been extremely happy and our daughter's currently having a gap year but she's off to study law next year. We have taken the solution of sending the children boarding for secondary school and um, for the older two boys that was a great success um, and as I said Grace is saying like, she didn't realise what a country girl she was and how she, she, misses, um, she misses the country environment. Our, our results from our local high school here were excellent last year. And in fact, with the, um, the extra points you get for being rural, um, we had people who actually, if they got all the points, the rural points would have got over 100. You've been looking, observing women in rural practice, rural general practice for quite some time. What's failure and what's success? Can you define it as easily as that? And if, and if you can, what predicts a, a, an unhappy experience and what predicts a happy experience? Look at the community. Do they play sport? Do they do the things that you want to do? Do you feel safe? Does, it, does the community um, have ways of you interacting with it that make you feel comfortable? Is it, you know, is it a flyable distance or drivable distance from the significant others in your life? Are there particular issues for single women thinking about rural general practice? Um, again, I think it would be the network that they form when they come and also if they were going to practice as a solo practitioner, it would be around their involvement in the community and their involvement with others to help give them that support that they would need to maintain or, and sustain practice in a rural community. Um, their own safety may come into play and I know within our practice we have certain rules around safety, meaning we tend to see after hours our patients are asked to come to the practice where practical uh, rather than doing home visits. We do do home visits where necessary but where it is practical the patient is asked to come to the practice from a safety point of view. So those issues would come in for a single woman if she was practicing in a solo environment. Another fear I imagine that women might have if they're going to go to a small town is that the boundaries between work and family are hard to define. What's your experience of how women have dealt with that? Norman, that's a really um, key issue I think for people considering rural practice and I call it the frozen peas problem because it's being because that's all you eat. accosted about the frozen peas, over the frozen peas in the supermarket about a work certificate or about an issue. It's a problem about living and working in rural communities and defining boundaries. But I think it is, it is it's a skill and it's something you need to think about. But it's something that many of us have been able to negotiate and manage quite well. I have friends within the community that are very good at acknowledging boundaries and, and I can be at times not as good as my friends in picking up when boundaries are being um, encroached upon. So lines like, look, that, that sounds very important and something that we need to look at. How about you um, ring my surgery on Monday and we make an appointment to deal with that. So actually being upfront, being aware that when I'm starting to feel uncomfortable about something that someone is asking me, to actually make that statement. So be upfront. And also recognise if you're feeling uncomfortable, it's probably a good sign that what you're talking about shouldn't be being talked about in that environment. If people asked me to do things when I was off duty and that, I found that actually my friends used to just uh, divert them away. Um, 
Uh, but I think if you just set the limits, people are very good. You know, once they realise that when you're out, you're not really going to be helping them medically, uh, they don't ask you anymore. Um, there was uh, one time recently when I was at the supermarket and uh, somebody was asking me something medically. And actually the girl who was um, doing the supermarket checkout, she said, she's not at work, don't ask her anything medical. But it's, there's another aspect to that balance, which is also the balance between the time you have to spend at work and on call and being able to devote to your family and making those sorts of boundaries clear. How tough can that be when you're in an underdoctored town and there's kind of moral pressure on you to do more work? Norman, you're absolutely right. It is a pressure and it is something you need to weigh up. But what you also need to weigh up and negotiate with the community is your longevity. You can't sustain an environment where the choice that you're making either to, is, is too great. So you're working more than you want to work. You're working more than you think is good for the, your family, your, your spouse or your um, personal circumstances. One of the problems with rural is that people do feel pressure to work because uh, there's, there is always a lot of work to do, but that's everywhere. Um, so that's why you've got to make a decision yourself how much you do um, and, uh, and stick to that. So we encourage women to negotiate with their communities. It may be better that they're on call three days out of seven and stay in the community than they leave. And those boundaries can be negotiated. And, and part-time work and, and the understanding and support for part-time practice in rural areas is growing. It was really nice to, to arrive in town and have, have um, my bosses at that stage saying, choose when you want to work. Um, and, um, you know, you can bring the baby in to, um, you know, have feeds, you can, you know, h how can we, how can we help? And yeah. it was, so it was lovely, yeah. So do you have a life outside medicine? Absolutely. <laughs> so I, I, I do, and I think that's one of the things uh, we talked about when we set up our practice. We are part-time practitioners, but our aim was to have a sustain sustainable form of practice. and. Because we do work part time, it gives me time to, to work in areas of medicine outside it, but also to do things like bushwalk, spend time with my family, which I really, really enjoy, spend time with my church, which I really, really enjoy. And when you look back on your career so far mm. in rural general practice as a woman, what were the best bits? The diversity uh, that I'm able to practice, um, the skill base set that I learnt in medical school, I was surprised that I was able to do and am still able to do the diversity of practice within a regional centre. So I have the backup of a local hospital and I'm, when I'm on call I'm not necessarily dealing with acute choking children but I'm still able to care for my palliative care patients. I'm still able to admit someone with pneumonia to a hospital and watch them through the course of their illness. So that has been one of the highlights. I'm passionate about rural health because I think there's so many rewards when you work in a rural area in terms of that you get to know people over a longer period of time and you can build relationships and it's not a person that comes in and you never see them again. You actually get to know them and their family and have a better understanding of the context of their life as well. I think the rewards are um, just the pleasure with, you know, to, to see that you've solved a problem and made a really big difference to a community. We've thoroughly enjoyed being in the country. We don't regret it at all. And when we keep looking at our options of where we want to be, we don't want to go back to the city, we want to stay within our rural community. We've got a great house, we've got, you know, I can't... Um, you know when you look through those real estate things, I look through and I think, why would I move there from here? <laughs> you know? And it's a, it's a lovely area. Um, and we've got lots of friends there, so yeah, we, we will retire in Camperdown. The other highlight for me is, is managing patients from birth um, through to now because I've been in practice for long enough, some of them are having their own children and seeing that generational care is, is actually extremely rewarding. Being a rural doctor is a wonderful thing and you can have, you can have a great life as a woman doctor in a rural community. <laughs>